The 21st century has been fraught with concerns about safety. From the micro level, where we look at fraud and credit fraud and theft, for example, through to the macro level, when we look at the terrorist threat. The added issue here is that the nature of the terrorist threat keeps changing. So it's gone from organised groups as well as the lone wolf and the nature of what these different groups are targeting, whether it's cyber, whether it's aircraft, whether it's um, uh, open places and spaces such as um, soft targets, stadiums, postcard targets, the nature of it is constantly morphing and changing. And this means that for organisations, extreme events say from a terrorist attack exposes them to high levels of risk and uncertainty, which can stretch them to and beyond their limits. And so the difficulty is when we look in the context of New Zealand that although these extreme events are probably random and they're improbable, that they do actually occur and we need to be prepared. And this is a country without a history of a lot of threats but the nature of the global threats now and, and the way it's morphing and changing is such that we need to be prepared and working together as much as possible so that there is a very quick business recovery. The implications for society are that your critical national infrastructure can easily uh, be exposed to extreme events. For example, if your critical national infrastructure like communications, your food um, supply chains, um, your water and utility companies are private sector owned, um, what have they done to prepare themselves in the event of an extreme event? So for example in the UK 80% of the critical national infrastructure is private sector owned and often foreign owned. Um, so to what extent are they working with local government authorities, central government, um, so there's public-private partnership to prepare for uh, extreme events which means that there is a quick recovery and we're back to business as, as usual as soon as possible. From my extensive research and consulting with the British government and um, British um, PLC, what we have found is that there is um, a, a, ver a great variation in degree of preparedness across sector and across regions in the UK. And partly that is to do with the fact that um, some organisations have been more exposed to previous disasters and therefore they have um, a lot of experience They've had their resilience tested and uh, they're able to use that knowledge to inform their current practice and also other organisations in their supply chain. But it does vary a lot uh, in organisations in terms of the structure. Where does the business con continuity um, manager sit? Do they have board representation? How much influence do they have over decisions about finance and what to invest in terms of um, pre preventing or being prepared for any kind of disaster? Um, the degree of regulation. So airlines and banks are in highly regulated sectors although many of them were coming to us asking for advice to learn from other sectors because they didn't want to just have the same knowledge flowing around the same ideas, they wanted best practice from other sectors. But regulation certainly sets a standard, a minimum of compliance and auditing. Um, and also the culture of the organisation, some are very audit and compliance driven where others uh, see resilience as part of their whole organisational culture because they want to be able to be resilient to any kind of threat not just the one they've perhaps just experienced, which might have been flooding. They want to be able to be prepared for a pandemic, a terrorist attack, a flood, or whatever it may be, and therefore they want resilient capabilities right across their organisational culture. Some examples of this would be, um, in the airline industry, catering and onboard catering has always been known to be a point of vulnerability for airlines because the food could be poisoned or a bomb could be put in um, the, the food delivery units. So um, some organisations have gone so far to mitigate that risk by actually not having catering on board at all or having um, sandwiches or different kinds of um, onboard service. Um, certainly the low cost airlines have gone that way. Um, they also outsource their security checking and get um, the airports to do it for them. But when we look at um, the differences um, to utility companies, there was a, um, a famous case of Seven Trent in the UK which had um, did not deal very well with the flooding in, in 2007, then there was the pit review. And, and what happened there is like many organisations, there's still an uh, expectation the government is going to step in and resolve the problem at the point of the crisis and then probably help the organisation through the crisis. But actually the UK government, like many governments in the world, with the nature of extreme events, want the private sector organisations to be prepared and manage themselves through these crises. Um, because the unintended consequences, certainly in the UK flooding example, was that generators got flooded which affected local hospitals which caused un even more crisis and catastrophe. So these organisations that are now part of the critical national infrastructure that are private 
sector owner now need to show to governments and insurance organisations that they are being prepared. And I've seen this with the Canary Wharf Group in London. Um, they have a resilience group uh, that works very closely with the government and all the big bank representatives come together for meetings with uh, blue light services and prepare for uh, all sorts of different scenarios and events, not just one kind, but several of uh, uh, threats that might happen and then how would they respond to that collectively as a group considering they're all sharing a shared space uh, in, in London. I think business continuity managers for example have quite a difficult time um, trying to convince people that sometimes there is a threat and um, Certainly in the UK there's a risk register for every region that you can go on the website and see what the risks are in your particular region which can you know, educate um, managers and they can look to, to do scenarios with their staff, uh, part of their training to look at how to be prepared for different uh, types of events and also they can work with local government agencies, um, organisations in their geographical area. Uh, so for example if it's a large shopping mall um, or if it's the CBD area, involve all the companies that are around a certain area area uh, and bring their representatives together with blue light services and government and, 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 and so forth to play out some of these scenarios. It's called exercising and it's very common in the UK to come across these large exercises going on where they'll be playing out a scenario and close certain streets and that's part of the public-private partnership so that there's a higher awareness amongst general population of what's going on. Um, also compliance and audits uh, are useful but that often is just as the minimum. It's about getting everyone to be aware. So we could look at a, a recent example like Sydney with the Lint Cafe and, and you could ask questions about were those staff prepared for any kind of incident? Were they aware that they are near the critical national infrastructure such as Channel 4 Studios which was right across the road and thereby being nearby they could potentially be involved in something at any time? And also were the staff, um, had they practised scenarios and were they trained in what to do? Uh, certainly in some of the large hotels here in Auckland I remember over 20 years ago being trained to be aware of um, bomb threats and, and certain types of things that might happen when there's high profile people uh, staying in the hotel who could potentially be a target. So it's about that awareness at all levels of the organisation uh, and making sure that uh, everyone is prepared and aware that something could happen at any time. Organisations can improve their resilience um, through a number of means. Um, one of them is to recognise where they're located. And so if you're near iconic um, sites like Sky Tower or, or postcard potential targets like museums or historic buildings or even near Eden Park, any of these very big um, iconic structures, then you have to realise you could be vulnerable as well, not just if you're by an airport, for example. Um, and the threat can be that your location is near uh, other organisations similar to your own. So in a CBD, for example, I mentioned uh, Canary Wharf before, there's about 18 or 20 global banks there. They're all there because they want to be together, they want to cluster, but by being all together they're actually raising their um, threat profile. It's a higher level of risk by actually being all together because they can all be targeted um, in ways uh, through um, terrorism which will mean that globally all their brands are affected in, in one go. So you have to be aware of, of where you're located, um, the type of vulnerability that could be coming through, whether it's a cyber threat within the organisation, whether it's an external threat to, to um, your building or infrastructure, or if it's to uh, an organisation in your supply chain or your geographical area, you need to think about your community resilience, your corporate resilience, there's multi-layered levels of, of resilience you need to be thinking about and have a more joined up approach working with the public services uh, on how you respond because the main aim is business recovery, getting business back to usual and uh, the recovery of the economy or the entire region as quickly as possible. So therefore there's a real need not to be complacent, um, not to think that some of the threats are, are not ever present, they are present and it's about being aware that you need to be investing and being resilient and you need to be creating a culture inside the organisation that people are able to know what to do in, in the context of any kind of extreme event, not just relying on the business continuity manager let's say, um, being able to be uh, um, empowered and have it done exercises to look at different kinds of uh, events that may happen and therefore know what to do if they're faced with some kind of crisis.